Hello everyone, welcome to Grand Rounds. We have a repeat speaker because he was so good the first time we invited him back for his second visit. It's William Banks who got his MD degree from the University of Missouri in Columbus, in Columbia. His endocrine fellowship was at the VA in Tulane. He received a VA Career Development Award, then worked with Abba <coughs> Paston uh, for a long time, 18 years, on peptide transport across the blood-brain barrier. At St. Louis University in the department of John Morley, he's the, he, was the associate, he is the Associate Director of Research of the GRECC uh, at the Seattle VA since 2010. He has over 400 non-abstract publications. That means that they're the real thing, yes? Um, is, <laughs> is editor-in-chief of Current Pharmaceutical Design and is on the editorial board of 12 other journals, has received numerous awards and given special lectures. Currently, he holds three RO1s for investigation of blood-brain barrier interactions with diabetes, Alzheimer's, and drug development for obesity. Dr. Banks. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, it's a rainy day, so I don't feel too bad that I'm preventing you from hiking. Uh, if it were a beautiful day, you know, I know many of you might not be here. And me too. But at any rate, today I want to convince you that the blood-brain barrier is actually central to uh, the study and the application of neurology and psychiatry. And um, I feel that I have my job uh, sort of cut out for me because if we consult our textbooks, um, here are some of the textbooks I've looked up, and uh, there's only about three paragraphs total on the blood-brain barrier um, in all these uh, textbooks. And um, just to have, you know, we need a control sort of substance to, uh, to compare that to. If you pick, let's say, obesity, they've got two paragraphs on obesity. And if you look at the psychiatry textbooks, um, two to three paragraphs uh, in, on blood-brain barrier and five entries total, but 31 on obesity. So uh, how is it that I can tell you that the blood-brain barrier is so important? Well, first of all, uh, we'll go into more detail, but just as a quick overview, the blood-brain barrier controls delivery to the brain. And when anything that it does goes bad, there's a possibility of disease. So there is, for example, a familial dementia in which the blood-brain barrier is unable to deliver the adequate amount of glucose that the brain requires. Drug delivery is very important. If you want to treat CNS diseases, you've got to get drugs into the brain. That means negotiating the blood-brain barrier. We'll talk about that. Immune cell trafficking. And uh, that can uh, be connected, therefore, with uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, PML, and uh, neuroaids. Uh, viral entry also, of, of course, associated with neural aids, but also rabies and measles are able to access the brain. And again, they have to negotiate the blood-brain barrier. Some diseases are caused by neurotoxins. The blood-brain barrier is responsible for keeping neurotoxins out of the brain. And when it's unable to do that or fails, we wind up with dialysis dementia in the case of aluminum, uh, lead poisoning in the case of, of lead, prion diseases, if you want to consider that as a neurotoxin, cytokine transport and secretion, uh, we'll talk a little bit about sickness behavior. Uh, and then the transport of regulatory substances, which I'll emphasize quite a bit. When that goes awry, uh, the blood-brain barrier can be involved in supporting or even causing things uh, like ethanol withdrawal seizures, Alzheimer's disease, and obesity. So what I want to do today is first give you a working definition of the blood-brain barrier. And uh, eventually, I'll talk to you about diseases that either affect the blood-brain barrier or uh, diseases that the blood-brain barrier may actually be producing that are relevant to psychiatry and, and, uh, and neurology. Um, but in between, I think um, I'm going to stick in a section about getting drugs into the brain. So not only is this important for the field, of course, but it's also a big problem in pharmaceutical industries. The blood-brain barrier is a major, major obstacle to the development of drugs for whatever is your favorite CNS disease. So first, let's talk about what the blood-brain barrier is. Um, old concept goes back to about 1890 when Paul Ehrlich, who eventually won the Nobel Prize uh, for the development of pharmaceuticals, uh, as a student did the following experiment. Uh, pharmaceuticals largely derived from the German dye industry. They made a pot of money making blue aniline dyes. 
And so Paul Ehrlich was sticking dyes into all kinds of animals and seeing where they go. And as you can see uh, here, the dye has stained all the tissues blue. We have little Smurf mice. And um, if we look at the internal tissues, they would be so dark, so black, we put that much dye into them, you, you couldn't distinguish things. In fact, here's the inside inside of the, of the skull. There's not much here, really, except bone and a little bit of dura matter. And here, less than a millimeter away, is the central nervous system, essentially no staining at all. So uh, this gave concept to the idea of a blood-brain barrier. Unfortunately, many people think that this is what the blood-brain barrier is like, a sort of rigid external coating around the brain with some things that leak in, very passive, very very uh, non-functional in, in that way. Um, this is a bad concept, bad model. It's really medieval uh, thinking. <laughs> Thank you for the most audiences don't get that. Uh, this is a much better. Um, I, guess, I guess you all have pretty good scores on the LMSE. Uh, so, uh, or since I'm from St. Louis, the slums. Um, so here's a much better model. Uh, this is the capillary bed of the brain, and it's different from capillary beds and the rest of the tissues, modified in three ways. First, wherever uh, the endothelial cell comes in contact with another one or itself, it's cemented together by these tight junctions. And um, the other two modifications are an absence of something. There's a greatly decreased macropenocytosis, and there's also uh, essentially no fenestrate. Those are little holes or cannuli that would go from one side of the endothelial cell into the other, into the tissue bed. Here's, by comparison, capillary from, uh, from the heart, and you can see it's loaded with vesicles and little cannuliculi and everything like that. So as a res result of this, <coughs> The central nervous system, the capillary bed, does not produce an ultrafiltrate. And to give you an idea of how formidable this barrier is, for every 200 molecules of albumin that's in the uh, bloodstream, there's uh, one molecule uh, in the cerebral spinal fluid. And actually, it doesn't come from residual leakiness. It comes from a different pathway. So this is really a very significant barrier. <coughs> Without producing an ultrafiltrate, though, that, that, that's good on the one hand because it keeps all this circulating riffraff out of the CNS, you know, and gives the brain a pristine area to do its thing. But um, it's bad news on the other because without a nourishing ultrafiltrate, how is the brain going to get all the glucose that it needs and all the amino acids and vitamins and minerals? And uh, the answer is the blood-brain barrier uh, comes to the rescue here as well uh, because it has lots of transport systems that go in, transport systems go out, bidirectional transport systems. Um, and the blood-brain barrier gets these instructions and adapts to the brain because it's sort of part of a neurovascular unit. Although the blood-brain barrier, the endothelial cells form the physical barrier, they're in constant talk with uh, cells within the CNS uh, neurons and glia and microglia and astrocytes and, and all those, and pericytes, uh, and as well as with circulating cells and hormones produced by, by tissue beds. And so by this way, it's in constant contact with the, the rest of the body, and it sort of figures out what the brain needs at any point in time and adapts to that need. And if it doesn't adapt to that need, we get diseases. So here are the extra barrier roles of the blood-brain barrier. Because it first forms a barrier, it then can do these things. So it plays a nutritional role. Transports in glucose, amino acids, free fatty acids, vitamins, just about everything the brain needs. It's important in homeostatic uh, regulation. Um, it, depend, it, it dictates how much sodium gets in, how much potassium, the pH of the, of the central nervous system, and has brain-to-blood efflux systems to keep out toxins. And then the area that my lab has been most interested in, that of communication, because it also regulates the entry and exit of regulatory substances, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So to summarize, <laughs> everything I put together, of course you'll know on the one hand that the brain is connected with the rest of the body through the nerves, but on the other hand, there is this blood-brain barrier that's the, the middle part of the sandwich that acts sort of as an interface in this humoral communication that's going on between the, the blood and, and, and the brain. So how do things get across the blood-brain barrier? And we're sort of going to sneak over and talk about how drugs get in. Sagittal transport systems, I've just told you, are very important. Membrane diffusion is also very important, and particularly for drug delivery. There's that residual leakage, but, and that's how that one molecule out of 200 uh, CSF gets in. Absorptive endocytosis and diapedesis, we won't talk about today, just in interest, interest of time. 
This is used, these processes are used by viruses that are tricking the blood brain barrier or by immune cells that want to traffic in and out. So most of our drugs actually get in by diffusion. And what we're talking about here, this is, this is true for any cell type. Uh, in fact, the first uh, study of this uh, was actually in blue-green algae. This may look like an old slide, uh, and it is. It's from a paper published uh, early 1930s. So since that time, we've understood that small lipid-soluble molecules can penetrate uh, tissues, and that's certainly true of the blood-brain barrier. And this is a uh, characteristic that's non-saturable. The more lipid-soluble you are, up to an extent, the better you get in, and the smaller you are, uh, the better you get in. Uh, and the formula would be the inverse square root of the molecular weight. And some of my favorite drugs get in this way. Uh, there is uh, methanol, or sorry, ethanol, uh, nicotine, and morphine all get in by this way. So uh, this is some uh, classic paper by Oldendorf around 1972. Uh, what's interesting, here's morphine. Morphine actually doesn't penetrate the blood-brain barrier very well. This is with an older method, a brain uptake index that uh, Oldendorf actually constructed and was very versatile for substances that got in pretty well. We, we really learned a lot with this method, but it's, it does have a lower limit of sensitivity and morphine really doesn't, can't really show its entry very well. But if we make morphine more lipid soluble by just ad adding this methoxy group on it, that's all codeine is, um, then uh, it gets in pretty well. And if we put a couple of, of uh, lipid soluble groups on heroin, we can get in like a shot. So this is one way to develop substances with lipid solubility, and hence we have drugs that um, can get into the CNS. But you can have too much of a good thing. I um, hope there are no um, dermatologists in the audience. Uh, there's a big battle, you know, between the vitamin D people and, and all that. But, uh, so you can have too much of a good thing, uh, and you can have too much lipid solubility. And, and the reason is because if you, if you sort of look carefully what we have is we have an aqueous environment here, and then we have this first membrane, and then the cytoplasm, that's a second aqueous env environment. And then this uh, other membrane, uh, the abluminal membrane, the one next to, this, to, the, to the brain, and then the interstitial fluid. So we have um, aqueous environment, membrane, aqueous environment, membrane, aqueous environment. That's what you got to do if you want to get into the brain. So if you're too lipid soluble, you'll get hung up in those membranes and not be able to partition back into the aqueous environment. Uh, likewise, if you're too lipid soluble, you'll be taken up by every other tissue in the body. So it's possible to increase blood-brain barrier permeability, but decrease the amount of drug getting in because you're being taken up by everybody else, by all of the, of the other places in, in the body as well. So it's a little bit tricky to use this. Also, uh, if uh, you make a molecule lipid soluble, uh, there's a substrate, uh, there's a brain to blood transport system, P glycoprotein, a little bit more about that later, that loves to grab small lipid soluble molecules and pump them out of the brain. Finally, you can make something too powerful. And I submit to you, I just showed you that we should be using heroin, right? Because it gets into the brain really, really, really well. But maybe it gets in too well. And actually, heroin is a pro-hormone. This is what people are trying to make, pro-hormones. Because it's really a modified morphine, gets into the brain, gets those lipid-soluble groups uh, cleaved off. You're left with morphine, which is now too lipid-insoluble to get back out. And it's actually morphine that does the, the, the work of heroin in the brain. But yet we use morphine clinically and uh, because we don't want something that's quite that big of a gun. In the, in the late 70s, a guy named Romer made some uh, fluorinated uh, enkephalins, which are the, uh, one of the classes of opiate peptides, but they were too neurotoxic. He got them in too well. So there's lots of examples of us overshooting and, uh, and doing that. So there's a lot of complications with developing drugs uh, based on lipid solubility. And this is really a nightmare for the pharmaceutical industries. They're really having trouble developing drugs. Part of the problem, to be honest with you, is their own doing. They refuse to study the blood-brain barrier. They want to black box it and just sort of try to come up with a universal carrier. But that's just not going to happen, I'm afraid. Um, of course, the blood-brain barrier membranes, like any cell membrane, have a lot of proteins in them too, and we've already talked a little bit about transporters. Uh, blood-brain barrier has transporters for all kinds of things. Uh, sometimes that gets co-opted by cells and viruses as well. And uh, here's what you get for a transport system. 
Here's again another, uh, the, the black line, the dark line, is uh, the relation between lipid solubility and an uh, index of blood-brain barrier uptake. It's log-log, so it looks like a sigmoidal curve. Here are substances that are not very lipid soluble and ought to be getting in about here, but they're getting in somewhere between about uh, 10 uh, to 40 times faster than they would uh, be expected to based on lipid solubility, and that's because they have a, a blood to brain transport system. Here's glucose, our old friend glucose, and most of the rest are amino acids. But um, the drug companies have used uh, the transporters very little, and I really don't understand that. You know, it seems to me that's really the, catalytic, uh, the, the Cadillac way of getting in. And I think most of the drugs that we do have as transporters are, have been by serendipity. Uh, and they're not uh, hard to understand that L-DOPA would use a, and, and gabapentin would both use amino acid transporters and that Aricept would use the cholinergic transporter. And uh, valproic acid, I think, is, is the one thing you might not be able to predict uses a monocarboxylic acid transporter. I'm still collecting these. They're so rare that it's hard to find bona fide examples in the literature. And, uh, oh, the tiger, of course, is a transport system, right? So uh, species-specific. Um, so the other concept that I'd like to introduce is that uh, there's this luminal or blood side membrane in the cytoplasm and then the abluminal side of the membrane. And these are different. It's a polarized, polarized uh, system. So the uh, blood side membrane has different lipids and different proteins and different transport systems than the other side. So what this sets us up for is unique brain-to-blood efflux systems. And this is also a big problem for drug development because many drugs you think would get in actually get pumped out. Uh, and as you'll see, it's critical to understanding what's going on with your patients. And, um, and uh, I think that the PGP, for example, will be the brain's version of cytochrome P450, probably even more important than that. And uh, one of my, for, for example, Lamotil. Lamotil we often use to uh, treat diarrhea, but it's an opiate. So why doesn't it have CNS effects? And the answer is because it's transported out very avidly by P glycoprotein. And if you have a P glycoprotein knockout animal, it has exactly the same uh, CNS profile as morphine. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the nicotine, uh, the tobacco worm. Uh, that lives on the nicotine plant. If any of us were to try to eat the nicotine plant, we would die from toxicity, and this worm can do that because it has, in what passes for its brain, uh, a transport system to keep nicotine out. And antiretroviral drugs uh, are often transported. So here's, here's the classes. Just look at all the classes of drugs that are P-glycoprotein substrates. Morphine is a weak substrate. That's why it doesn't get in all that well, but it's, not, it's a weak substrate, so enough gets in to do the thing. Well, pyramides are very, uh, or lamotil is a very um, intense uh, uh, ligand, and so it can't get in very well at all. Protease inhibitors, and so this is one of the reasons that we have trouble treating HIV once it gets into the brain, because the protease inhibitors are pumped out by P-glycoprotein, uh, and, uh, and AZT is pumped out by uh, an ion system. Calcium channel blockers, uh, s some of the steroids, some of the antibiotics, it goes on and on. So there's all these classes of drugs. And this often dictates whether a drug will have an effect or if you can use it and not have an effect. Because, you know, let's face it, we get to the point where we depend on a drug that will have an effect or won't. And if those rules change, then we wind up having subtherapeutic effects or CNS toxicity effects. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit later about why that's sort of important. So to summarize this section, though, how, what, what are the major dictators of how a drug gets in or whether a drug will get in? Well, first we've talked about lipid solubility, transmembrane diffusion, and the characteristics that are there, or there could be a transport system in. Um, if you get in very, very, very quickly, like glucose, then cerebral blood flow is important. The faster the cerebral blood flow, the more we'll get in. If you don't get in very fast, which is usually true of many of the regulatory substances, then cerebral blood flow is, can be ignored. Working against you, however, are saturable transport systems that go the other way. Degradation, which can occur in the blood, in the brain, or in the blood-brain barrier. There are substances where the blood-brain barrier uh, enzymatic system is the major barrier. Uh, and, of course, we always have to think about pharmacokinetics. If a substance is rapidly cleared from the blood, it never has a chance to get to the blood-brain barrier, no matter how good its penetration is. And that, as we said, can sometimes be a problem for lipid-soluble substances. 
and protein uptake and things like that that may not make substances available. So these are the major tenets by which uh, drugs can get in or not. Um, and uh, there's a lot of drugs uh, uh, approaches going on in the pharmaceutical industry. Some of them well thought out and some of them don't have a chance. Uh, and some of them are um, sort of bypassing the blood-brain barrier like nasal delivery or antithecal delivery, which seems to work very well for certain drugs. Um, uh, so this is really a very, very uh, interesting field. So now I want to switch gears and talk about the blood-brain barrier. Uh, what, what the, 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 I call it, I'm looking for Charlie Brown diseases because he says, you know, his brain and his body hadn't spoken to each other in years. So I'm looking for those things where the brain and the body aren't talking to each other or angry at each other because of the blood-brain barrier, which is the interface from the hormonal point of view, um, is, is causing problems. And so here's a short list of things that I think I can, can add to that category. Uh, and um, just to go through this a little bit quickly, things like uh, uh, obesity, we'll talk about that. You know, maybe the psychiatry textbooks knew what they were talking about there. Alzheimer's disease, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, glucose transport, uh, we talked about that a little bit already. Uh, and sickness behavior, some other things like that. So just a one more word, a few more words about peak glycoprotein because its problems um, can certainly fit into this category. So the trick is that we don't all have the same amount of peak glycoprotein. And uh, some of us are overexpressors and therefore would expect to get less drug into the brain and some of us are underexpressors and therefore we expect to get more drug in the brain. So we already have this moving target. You don't know where your patient is and as you can see, only 45% of patients are middle of the road. And what's worse, uh, and we talked about already some of the drugs that uh, are important to this. Um, perhaps this is why about 30% of schizophrenics are resistant to all the anti-seizure medications with the exception of valproic acid because valproic acid is the only anti-seizure medication that isn't a PGP substrate. And we now know that inflammation uh, increases PGP function. So that would keep drugs more out of the brain. And if you think about how many of our patients in the hospital have to some varying degree a, a pro-inflammatory condition, you begin to start to see that we may really have a moving target for all our PGP substrates when it comes to giving them to our folks. What about if you have someone who's on five or six PGP substrates? About 30% of the, of the drugs we use are PGP substrates to one degree or the other. Um, could we begin to block one against the other? So now I'm going to talk about sickness behavior, which uh, is the thing that you get when you have the flu or a pro-inflammatory condition, and you just want to stay home and sleep and rest. You're not have no interest in eating. Uh, you're you're you know you've lost interest in everything else in the world, uh, and you have also problems uh, remembering and learning. So we know that all of these are mediated. Uh, that the, this was a concept that uh, Robert Dancer introduced about 20 years ago in the area that we would now call neuroimmunology or psychoneuroimmunology. And a few years later, he advanced it a little bit more and said, you know, this is an adaptive change. This is, a, this is probably good for you because if you're really ill, you need to stay home and not be, you know, if you're a hunter-gatherer going out looking for, for, for bison when you're really kind of ill. Save your energy, fight the infection, get, get better. So short term, it's adaptive. And we know that um, this is uh, mediated, all of these effects are mediated actually by a single cytokine, interleukin-1. And it mediates this message. The interleukin-1's in the blood. It's got to get its message into the brain. And it does so by various uh, mechanisms. The um, fever response is interleukin-1 acting at a, at a receptor on the blood-brain barrier and inducing the blood-brain barrier to release prostaglandin, which then mediates the fever response. But we are interested in why, is, how is interleukin-1 producing uh, memory impairments? And uh, we knew that interleukin-1 also crosses the blood-brain barrier. Here's a study about 20 years ago. It was our lab that first showed that cytokines could cross the blood-brain barrier, and boy, was that controversial for a long time. 
but now it's well accepted. And this is just the way you do a, we do a blood-brain barrier experiment. We radioactively label the interleukin injected into the bloodstream, and over time, uh, over time looked at how much accumulated in the brain. Uh, we simultaneously, with a different label, injected albumin, so every animal acts as its own control. This tells us that it's not only getting in better than albumin, but the blood-brain barrier is not disrupted to molecules this size. And we repeat the whole experiment again, giving unlabeled material. So, and now the curve goes down. So this tells us it's crossing the blood-brain barrier, and this tells us it's crossing biosaturable transport systems. So you see, blood-brain barrier research is very easy. If you're looking for a new field to go into academically, we've got lots of projects you can do, lots of publications, you know. So, uh, and also an interesting thing about human interleukin-1 alpha, and murine interleukin-1 alpha, is taken up by a special area of the brain. I mean, it goes all over the brain but it's particularly taken up by this area, the posterior division of the septum, which is sort of a rel relay between the front part of the brain and the midbrain, and uh, seems to be conducting, that whole pathway is often involved in things like memory and food and things like that, just the sorts of things that, that sickness behavior affects. So we came up with this, um, this uh, idea, and uh, this paper was a very involved paper because, you know, being good pharmacology guys, we had to do dose response curves, which always complicates things, but once you get there, you, you really have confidence of what you found. But the general idea is that we would infuse human interleukin-1 alpha. Now, if it worked directly crossing the blood-brain barrier, then it's obviously human interleukin-1 alpha that's acting at the neuron of the PDS. Um, but if it's working indirectly, then um, any way that it could be affecting the uh, learning and memory other than crossing the blood-brain barrier would have to be through what we call one of the relay mechanisms, and that would ultimately be mouse interleukin-1 working at, at, the, at the neuron. So all we had to do was give blocking antibodies uh, that were specific for the human and specific for the mouse, and we could figure all this out. Now, as I say, it's a little more elaborate than that because we have to do all these response curves, <laughs> and we specifically did memory because you can teach the animal before you give them interleukin-1-alpha, and therefore you get away with the immediate sickness behavior problem, and then you come back and test them, if they remember it, a week later. So you've gotten, a re you've gotten away from all the acute kinds of problems, and you're sort of just looking, in a pure sense, uh, the effect of interleukin-1 on memory consolidation. And uh, here's the, sort of the main slide that we found, and it's, uh, that uh, this is uh, no uh, treatment, it's normal saline in the periphery and goat serum as a uh, source of uh, nonspecific antibody given directly into the PDS. And this is pretty much what a, a mouse would do even if you didn't inject them. This is about how well they learn. And then we injected interleukin alpha into the periphery, they got a little bit more stupid. And then when uh, we uh, injected interleukin alpha into the periphery, but uh, the blocking antibody into the PDS, we returned them pretty much to normal state. So uh, this we felt formally showed and was the first example of a cytokine having an effect behind the blood-brain barrier to produce a behavioral effect. And uh, so that this part is mediated by interleukin-1-alpha. Now, other effects of sickness behavior in interleukin-1-alpha seem to be mediated through different pathways. We, don't have, we haven't parsed them all out, but the guess is that the cytokines are just acting in all kinds of different ways to produce all kinds of different effects on the CNS, some direct and some not. So I think another great example of how the blood-brain barrier participates in dictating behavior or uh, communication, uh, uh, dictating behavior that results from communication between the peripheral tissues and the central nervous system, and how diseases can arise is by leptin transport and leptin transport in obesity. So this field began about 1950. I'm not going to ask people to raise their hands who, are, who were born before 1950. Um, uh, but uh, this is, this is back in the days when there were no animals. You know, you couldn't just call up uh, Jax or Taconic and order your search animals. If you're a researcher, you had to go out and find your own mouse or dog or medical student to work on. <laughs> and um, so these guys at Taconic got this great idea. Hey, let's, let's start breeding mice and some of those goofy scientists, you know. And uh, so they said, you know, yeah, but how many regular mice can we, we sell? If we find disease models, we can sell even more. And so here you've got this mouse that they, they saw in 1950. Uh, and you can see the guy on, the, uh, on your right. He's much fatter, right? 19 grams instead of 16. I mean, that's really exciting. I mean, that guy is really, really much fatter. You know, can you appreciate that? And, and it's really exciting. And, um, 
as time went on, there was a little bit, a little bit more change too. Um, <laughs> so this is the OBOB mouse. Uh, it has a genetic defect, natural mutation, does not produce what eventually was discovered to be a leptin. My lab calls these guys pancake mice because they're so obese, when you put them down, they just flatten out. And um, so about 1960, a guy named Friedman said, you know, I think obesity is hormonal. Now, I don't know if it's that the obese person has too little of a hormone or they have too much of something making them obese. So he decided to do a parabiotic experiment. He took a fat mouse and a thin mouse and he tied together their circulation. So if it's a hormone that makes you fat, then the thin mouse would get fatter. And if it's the absence of a hormone that makes you fat, then the fat mouse would get thinner. And what happened is the fat mouse got thinner. So uh, in the OB, and he did this with OBOBs, so there's something missing from the OBOB. So this was a, a point out about 15, year, 15 years after their initial discovery. And another 25 years went by before Jeff Friedman, uh, actually 35 years went by, who in one of the early applications of molecular biology found the gene and, found by, and thereby found the protein that is missing and called leptin from the Greek word leptos for thin. And this is the way it should work if everything went fine. Now leptin is about 16,000 Daltons, about one-fourth the size of uh, albumin. So it should be excluded by the blood-brain barrier. Uh, but it's produced by fat. The more fat you have, the more leptin you have, okay? So if I know your BMI or your fat mass, I can predict your leptin level and vice versa. Pretty heavily correlated. But it does cross the blood-brain barrier because there's a saturable transport system for it that, as far as we know, only transports leptin. And it's, although it's located throughout the brain, it's particularly concentrated in the arcuate nucleus, the feeding center, and there it shuts off feeding mechanisms and increases thermogenesis. So if you eat less, burn more calories, you're going to reduce your body fat. And uh, so what we really have here is a negative feedback loop. And if everything worked the way it shows on this slide, there'd be no obesity, there'd be no anorexia, we would all be ideal body weight, whatever that is. But obviously something goes awry. So where could this system break? Um, this is just a slide that, again, shows the formal way that uh, our lab was the first to show uh, formally, uh, pharmacokinetically, that leptin actually did cross the blood-brain barrier, although uh, many labs at, by that point um, uh, had, had suggested that and had indirect evidence that was true. So the answer is it can break at any one of the places that's possible. If you parse it through, there are five possible places. You can have no fat. Of course, then you wouldn't be obese, but you'd have no leptin. Uh, you can have leptin, uh, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. You could have leptin, but it doesn't work at the receptor. You could have a problem in the downstream neural circuitry, so CNS lesions. And, about, and indeed, about 4% of uh, people with obesity uh, have a problem with the MCR4 receptor, uh, melanocortin 4 receptor. But the other 96% uh, don't. Um, one blow came, uh, Amgen bought this uh, from uh, Friedman for a bunch of money, thinking that humans would be like the OBOB mouse, no leptin. So they're going to make the leptin protein and treat us, you know, like we treat diabetics with insulin. But unfortunately, the fatter you are, the higher your, uh, your leptin. So humans don't have an OBOB kind of condition. They have resistance to leptin, sort of like type 2 diabetics are resistant to insulin and type 1s are insulin deficient. We have type 2, di uh, type two obesity, I guess you would say, in that parallel. So three, four, and five are the conditions, the lesions that would produce a high leptin level in the face of, um, of obesity. And uh, it was, uh, so one of those you see is the blood-brain barrier transporter. And uh, the first evidence though, that uh, this resistance occurred at the blood-brain barrier, and first at the blood-brain barrier, was actually about three years after leptin was discovered. Not our lab, so you can believe what they said. And what they did is they just took animals and started fattening them up. Not, not the OBOB guys, just regular old run-of-the-mill uh, genetically indescript outbred animals. And they showed that as they got fatter and fatter, they went through a stage where they would not respond to leptin given peripherally, but would respond if you gave it directly into the brain. Now, eventually they got to the point they wouldn't, wouldn't respond to leptin at all. So the shorthand of this means that early on we have 
a problem getting across the blood-brain barrier, and later we have a problem getting across the blood-brain barrier and also at the receptor, post-receptor level. So here's one reason that we have the problem, and that is that the leptin transporter is saturable. And uh, for reasons I won't go into today, I think they have to do with evolution. Uh, the best part of the curve is down here uh, where most Westerners are not. This is where hunter-gatherers are, okay? And uh, also people with anorexia nervosa or people with cancer and things like that. And then as you go up across the obesity scale, uh, somewhere around here is true obesity. Um, the, the transporter just sort of meets its limit. So that's, that's one cause. Uh, and our lab was the first to show, again, formally, although it had been suggested by other labs, formally that indeed uh, obese animals did transport leptin less, less well. But then we found out that there's another reason besides the saturable transport system, and that is that serum triglycerides impair the transport of leptin across the blood-brain barrier. And so, and we think this is really interesting. Uh, we all think of hypertriglyceridemia associated with obesity, but remember, it's associated also with starvation. So we think that probably going back and putting it together evolutionarily, that um, hypertriglyceridemia developed as a, sig a signal to the brain through leptin of a, a, a signal of, tra of, uh, of, um, of starvation. So what happens is something like this. If you're kind of going along regular days, you know, you have some days where you uh, get more calories than you expend and uh, other days you get fewer so you have to draw in your fat mass and all that's okay. Um, the fat mass produces leptin as I told you. The more fat you have, the more leptin you have in the blood. So a little bit of that crosses the blood-brain barrier and informs the brain about your adiposity. How much calorie reserves do you have? This is like your checking account. You know, every month the bank sends you a statement, you have this much money in your checking account. They never tell you you have too much money in your checking account. They only tell you if you're getting low, right? And so I think this is a similar system. And if you get enough, you sort of stop spending so many calories looking for more food, and you start doing all of these things. And by the way, Leptin turns out to be permissive for all of these things. The first one uh, of this type that was shown is uh, they took women uh, athletes who uh, were runners and had essentially no fat mass and were uh, amenorrheic. And they injected them with leptin and they started to menstruate. So this is, you know, so essentially what, what uh, their, their, their brains think are these women are starving and therefore we don't have enough caloric reserves to, ha to have reproductive function. Similarly, immune function, neurogenesis, and all of these things, all of these are very calorically expensive. They get turned off uh, when there's not enough fat mass, enough calories in the bank, so to speak, um, as, as, as mediated to the brain by leptin. And when you've, so what happens when you actually hit starvation mode? Well, interestingly, the fat uh, stops making leptin. Uh, actually, it goes down to about 30% of baseline levels. So it turns it off at that level, and now we're saying the triglycerides are mobilized because now you're using them for a uh, food source, and so triglyceride and free fatty acids go up in the blood, and as a byproduct, that inhibits the remaining leptin from getting into the brain. So the permissive effects are turned off, you stop using so many calories, and you start expending those calories looking for more calories. So we think that's, that's sort of how leptin is working. So if you look at it this way, uh, obesity is a disease of the blood-brain barrier. And therefore, we should be able to use this to develop a, th a therapy, right? And indeed, we have uh, done this uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gertler uh, in, um, in Israel. Uh, he developed a, a leptin antagonist uh, by pegylating it. And this uh, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, but it does inhibit endogenous leptin from crossing. So it goes up to the leptin transport and gets stuck there. And sure enough, if we treat animals with this, um, they, um, so I really want to show you this. There's day three. Look at that. Already a statistically significant increase in the body weight. And um, plateaus out. We stop it, and then they go back down. And uh, this is the first generation. It's the second generation that's even more potent. So it all fits. If we stop lifting getting into the brain, we'll, we'll get it there. So I think it's an, uh, to inform us how much uh, fat reserve we have, which also then makes sense why it doesn't really work in obesity, but does work when people are too thin. In the last few minutes, I'd like to switch gears and talk about a disease that I know no one in the room's heard about, and that's uh, Alzheimer's disease. But um, could be important to your field someday. 
Um, so there are a lot of theories. I'm collecting theories. I think I'm up to 12 now of uh, how the vas cerebral vasculature AKA blood brain barrier is involved in Alzheimer's disease. And I know you've heard about many of these decreased uh, glucose transport, decreased cerebral blood flow, uh, torturous capillary bed. And so the blood flow gets all messed up rheologically. But my favorite one, and none of these are, these are by and large not mutually exclusive. Um, oh, e interestingly, a leaky blood brain barrier. We, we're uh, just submitting an uh, invited review to cerebral, Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow Metabolism where we actually are reviewing blood brain barrier role in AD and we reviewed all that literature and I do not think the blood brain barrier is disrupted in, in Alzheimer's disease even though almost all the reviews right now just say in a very unreferenced way that it is. But my favorite theory is the vasculogenic theory which has to do with the clearance of A-beta from the brain. So Betsy Zlakovic, um came up with this theory about six or seven years ago. Uh, amyloid beta protein, many are peptide, many believe are proximal to the Alzheimer's disease condition and that it's not an overproduction in AD patients but a problem with clearance. And there's two ways to clear things. You chop it up enzymatically or since it's in the brain, you transport it out of the, out of the brain across the blood-brain barrier into the bloodstream. So he had evidence in humans and animals that this is, uh, that there's an impaired efflux of uh, A-beta across the blood-brain barrier. And indeed there's evidence for this not only in the Alzheimer's patients but also in the transgenic mice that overexpress APP and in the SAMP8, which is a natural mutation, uh, not a transgenic, that uh, recapitulates much of the features of, a of Alzheimer's disease. All of these have decreased efflux of A-beta. So we tested this formally. We built an antisense to LRP. That seems to be the major brain-to-blood transporter uh, for this and uh, indeed showed that we could knock down expression of LRP at the blood-brain barrier by about 50 to 60 percent. And when we did that, indeed, A-beta levels did go up, uh, sorry, there was decreased efflux of A-beta from the brain into the blood, and uh, indeed, brain levels of A-beta did go up, and in our animal models, they did have cognitive impairment. So we feel that this is very good. But it still begs the question, what sort of would shoot all this off? What would first ha um, sort of intervene to, to, to cause this decreased efflux? And we were uh, thinking about inflammation. Uh, there's, these are sort of different levels at which inflammation has been implicated in AD. Um, infections and inflammation sometimes seem to worsen conditions in, in uh, patients or even unmask AD. Uh, there seem to be inflammatory genes associated with the risk of AD in the AD brain. Uh, there is um, uh, uh, increased inflammatory mediators and activated microglia. You treat animals that are transgenic for APP with LPS, which induces the innate immune system. A beta levels go up and they get even more stupid than they are. Um, and um, so we wanted to ask the question, could inflammation interfere with the brain to blood transport of, of amyloid beta? And as I say, LRP is the main way of getting stuff from the brain into the blood. PGP turns out to also have A beta as a substrate, and that may prevent A beta from getting fr from the blood into the brain by, by keeping it out. And then there's cerebral uh, reabsorption of the cerebral spinal fluid, um, which is our bulk flow. So anything in CSF, CSF gets reabsorbed into the blood, and so anything in the blood will, in, the, in the CSF, will eventually get into blood. And that's minor compared to the transport system, but it is another pathway. So we. Uh, devised a uh, mouse model. These are normal mice, not transgenics. And we first showed that uh, if we treat these animals with LPS, indeed A beta efflux goes down dramatically. And interestingly, a large part of that component is sensitive to oxidative, is mediated through oxidative stress. Here we treated the animals with N-acetylcysteine uh, and been able to recover much of that, of that loss. So what are the mechanisms for that? Well, first we repeated this experiment using alpha-2 macroglobulin, which is another substrate for LRP. And indeed, we recapitulated the exact same finding. So we feel for sure LPS, by activating the innate immune system, does indeed um, work by inhibiting LRP activity. It also affected PGP activity, uh, but um, uh, it wasn't sensitive to oxidative stress. So again, this may be keeping A-beta from getting from the blood into the brain, but we don't think this is going to be important in keeping A-beta that's already in the brain out. 
And then we looked at inulin as a marker of CSF reabsorption, and we found that LPS also uh, affects uh, clearance. And you can either do that by looking at the disappearance from brain, in which there's less uh, disappearance. This is the rate of clearance. And here's the rate of appearance in the blood. And you see that's also decreased. So it seems that all three mechanisms are affected. Here's an, uh, a, a um, light microscope. Ah, you can't see it too well, so sorry. So I'll just tell you what I hope you would see. And um, actually, if you look at ZO1, that's a tight junction marker. And that you can see how crisp and clean all this is. Uh, and down here in animals treated with LPS, it's a little bit more raggedy. So you see, if you could see red, you'd see a very similar thing here, that uh, the LPS is nice and crisp outlining the cells, because that's where it should be. And then the LPS animals, it's, it's all foggy, uh, it, because it seems like it's being taken away from the surface of the cell and kept inside the cell where it can't transport. So the idea goes something like this, that uh, A beta induces an inflammation, and inflammation induces A beta, and they both induce oxidative stress and uh, each other, and so we got this vicious cycle, and one of the th substances that gets, gets whacked is LRP. And we do indeed know uh, from other studies where, and other tissues where LRP is expressed, it's very, very sensitive to oxidative uh, insult, and uh, when so insulted, it goes down in function. And then that would add to that positive feedback cycle as it goes on. So with uh, Josh Owen and, um, at the University of Kentucky and, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Butterfield there, we actually, we went to, we got Alzheimer's hippocampi, and we found that the LRP um, level in those brains was non-statistically decreased. It was uh, only about 15% lower. But when we looked at the uh, oxidative status of that, we found that the oxidative, that the LRP was significantly more oxidized by about 60%. Uh, in the AD patients. So we think that this is the mechanism that's, that's perhaps going on. So uh, into my talk, I think I finished for enough for a few questions. So the conclusions are the blood-brain barrier is a regulatory interface. It's important uh, roles in physiological regulation. Its dysfunction can lead to disease. And it's important in drug delivery. That's a scientific uh, conclusion. The gestalt emotional one that I hope you really leave with is that the blood that you hope you see the handwriting on the wall up here that uh, the blood brain barrier is very <laughs> took me more time to make this slide than the whole rest of the talk uh, <laughs> that the blood brain barrier is extremely important uh, uh, in three areas CNS normal function drug delivery and understanding diseases of the CNS thank you very much Yes, sir. Does the blood-brain barrier change from infancy to uh, young adulthood or teenage years, young adulthood, as the years go on? Uh, yes, it most certainly does. And uh, that makes a lot of sense because we know the developing brain has different metabolic demands than the mature brain or the, or the diseased brain. And again, that fits very well with this paradigm that there are various cells interacting in that neurovascular unit. And, and the brain, the, essentially the way to think about it is the blood-brain barrier is slave to the needs of the CNS. And that's exactly what we see. No more questions? Okay. Thank you all very much then.